Okay, I believe we are recording now, so fantastic. Welcome, welcome everyone to Estelle's PhD dissertation defense. Just so everyone knows the steps that will follow, it will start with uh, a presentation of the dissertation work, which may have questions along the way. In particular, these are usually questions to help understand or clarify what's being presented. The committee is invited to make to ask questions at any time. Uh, after the presentation is over, we'll continue with a period of open questioning. Uh, the public, the committee, anybody. Uh, at the end of that, we will excuse the public have any time for private questions the committee wishes to ask, we will then excuse Estelle, send her off to the waiting room, go through our deliberations and bring her back for, for the close. There is no uh, process in which we bring the public back in Zoom. And so uh, we will thank you very much for coming here to hear from her, to support her. And uh, we will leave it to her to, to, to notify you when, when everything's actually over. And with that, uh, Estelle, take it away. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much for the introduction, Joe. Um, I am just baffled to be here today. Um, it feels like I just started uh, yesterday, but here we are. Um, the title of my dissertation is Beyond Social Support, Spiritual Support as a Novel Design Dimension in Sociotechnical Systems. And uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you to every single person that is on this call right now. Um, it is, it has been quite the journey and I have gotten a lot of spiritual support from a lot of you and you're also the reason that I'm doing this work. So thank you for being here. Um, I think that this work has a lot to say, especially in light of COVID. Um, and especially because, you know, you couldn't be here without that such circumstance. So a lot of you couldn't be anyway. So with that, uh, a dissertation defense is all about telling a story. Um, and I'm going to start my story in 1996, actually, um, where at a point in time when everybody was using 56K modems and the internet was just starting to make its big debut across households in all, all across the world. And a lot of people as this was happening were um, really excited about what was going on, but also pretty unsure about the way that the internet was going to affect society at large. And I found this really delightful essay from someone named Michelle Bowens in 1996. And uh, what Michelle said was that basically people fell into two camps. In one camp, there was a group of people who were super excited about the potential of the internet to help humanity achieve a higher collective consciousness and a greater sense of spiritual unity um, in a way that we had never been able to in the, in the past of all mankind. On the other hand, we had a camp of people who felt that the internet was this technology that was going to drive us farther apart from nature and from our gods and leave us in a state of madness and chaos. And it, it's, this is kind of a question that really resonates still in 2020. A lot of people are talking about and thinking about, is the internet actually bringing us closer together or is it going to tear us apart and ultimately destroy society? Um, and some of the things that I'm going to say today, I think might feel obvious, especially to people like CaringBridge users who, you know, religion and spirituality are, you know, your bread and butter, it's the thing that sustains you. But something that's really surprising is that the HCI literature and social computing literature really hasn't talked about it that much, even despite it being such a fundamental thing to people, and despite the promise that people have been thinking about since the very early era of the internet. So uh, one of the times in our lives actually when spirituality becomes even more important is when people are going through a health crisis. Uh, it's also a time when we really need our social networks to pull together toward, for, pull together for us and um, provide all the support that we need to make it through the crisis. Uh, so if we go back one year after, 19, after that essay was written into 1997, a woman named Sona Maring invented a website that is now called CaringBridge. It used to be called the Internet Patient Link. Um, but she invented that website because one of her friends had a premature baby. And uh, instead of making calls to all of the individual people that they knew and sending out individual emails, she thought that a website might be a really great way to share information about what was happening with baby Bridget and to get the support that people needed on the other end as they're going through that journey. So uh, unfortunately, baby Bridget did not survive but CaringBridge has. Um, it's one of the original social networks actually predates Facebook, predates MySpace. And it's, not, it's almost not surprising that one of the first websites that came out that really connected people in this way was for helping people to get through a health crisis. And this website has also meant a lot to me personally 
So if we go another, take another time warp here uh, to April 22nd, 2015. Um, this is the first entry in a caring bridge site that was created for my own mom. So she was diagnosed with the cancer and one of her friends went online and decided to create a caring bridge site. And uh, the main feature of a caring bridge site is a journal, which is a place where patients and caregivers can write about the ongoing story of what the patient and caregiver are going through um, on that health crisis. And it also, so it allows people to share health updates with their community, um, generally people that they, a mix of people that they know in the real world and people that find their site online, as well as to receive supportive communications and comments from the people that come to visit the site. So lots of, lots of expressions of, uh, you can might, maybe are noticing that there's lots of religious mentions here about prayer, being with Christ, um, helping, helping people out as they're going through this journey. So uh, at 2015, actually, that same year, a little bit later, uh, uni the University of Minnesota joined forces with Caring Bridge to form a research collaborative. And I have been fortunate over the course of my PhD to be part of that collaborative and to, and to do this work um, with a very impactful nonprofit organization that also means a lot to me personally. So Caring Bridge is a very prominent example of an online health community. And online health communities are something that are um, a pretty important topic in HCI work because they're able to really get people the social support they need going through health crises. And a lot of prior work has explored topics around user retention and engagement in these communities, um, patterns of supportive exchanges, so features of the language that can predict things about people's health status or the support that they're getting, um, as well as matters of the end of life or digital legacy that people leave behind them when they exit these communities. And so uh, this whole body of work is predicated on the concept of social support. And since 1992, Katrona uh, and Sir have a classic paper where they introduced five different types of social support. So the first, uh, and, and mostly I'm gonna, the, the way that we study these things, it's been studied both online and offline, but in online spaces, the most common way to study this is by looking at the words that people use and categorizing those words into, into different uh, types of support. So the first type of support is instrumental support. So things like dropping off a meal at your friend's house when they are going through something hard or informational support. So imagine you got a diagnosis that you, uh, you know nothing about. A lot of people will go on the internet to find out more information and uh, try to figure out how to deal with their condition. These two types of support are both referred to as action facilitating support because they have some kind of a material outcome uh, that can help people to get through the crisis. There's also uh, emotional support, so which are typically words of empathy and compassion and trying to take care of a person's emotional state. Esteem support, which is this concept that people have an intrinsic value and an intrinsic worth and that the health crisis or the thing that you're going through is not gonna take away anything from that. Uh, or network support, so just the feeling that you belong in a group of people and uh, statements that affirm that sense of you belonging in this space. These three types of support are referred to as nurturance support. They don't necessarily have a material or a physical outcome, but they can help a person to feel nurtured and to feel more, to just to feel better. It supports better well being as they're going through the crisis. So, in partnership with CaringBridge, we originally wanted to look at uh, CaringBridge and see well, how are people getting these different types of support on CaringBridge? And uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to present three different studies. The first study is a study that will quantitatively characterize prayer support, which you'll notice wasn't included on that list before. Um, the second study is qualitatively characterizing spiritual support. And the third study is a prototypical deployment uh, for supportive communication. And we, we didn't have the opportunity to work with CaringBridge on that one. So we built a prototype and deployed that one. Okay, so the first study, quantitatively characterizing prayer support. So uh, we took two different approaches to doing this on Caring Bridge. The first approach is uh, studying log data. So we looked at data that already existed, specifically a, a randomly selected group of Caring Bridge journals, and did a content analysis on those Caring Bridge journals to see what types of support people were writing about as they were going through health crises. Uh, this has the advantage of providing a measure of externally observable user behavior. But uh, one issue with that is that what people, what we observe on the outside isn't necessarily the same thing as what's going on inside of people's minds or experiences. So the second approach that we used based on the content analysis was to directly ask users about what they value in terms of support. Uh, and we did this through a survey, a large scale survey with a thousand CaringBridge users to provide a measure of their internal user attitudes towards these different types of support. So in the content analysis, 
Uh, we originally were looking, we designed our methods to look at instrumental support. We wanted, this is something that had been a little bit neglected in the literature. There wasn't a lot looking at it. And one thing that's special about Caring Bridge is that a lot of the time people, uh, they actually know each other in their real world spaces and they're geographically co-located. So they are more capable of providing these types of support um, than for example, an online community where everyone's random and, and people don't live in the same place. Uh, but we also had a secondary goal of comparing instrumental support to the other types of categories that have been studied in the past. Um, but we ran we, we across this issue as we started our content analysis, which is that uh, there's this little problem where as in previous research, mentions of prayer or spirituality have kind of been subcategorized as this like lesser form of, or a, um, a subcategory anyways, of emotional support. And that didn't quite feel right as we were reading these Caring Bridge journals. We felt that prayer and the way that people wrote about it seemed different from emotional support and would be better if we measured it as its own standalone category. And we use this definition of prayer. So it's not specifically religious prayer, but it can be. Um, and all these type, different types of words that had some kind of an energetic feel to it. So prayers, spiritual blessing, positive karma, good juju, warm thoughts. You can see that these aren't specifically tied to any given um, belief system. And what we did was we measured people's expressions of appreciation on Caring Bridge journals. It turns out that uh, people on Caring Bridge actually thank people that they've received for, that th they thank people that they've received support from more often than they're directly asking for it. Uh, so it made more sense to measure expressions of appreciation. And I won't go into too many nitty gritty details of how we did that. But what we found was that prayer was present in 42% of the expressions of appreciation closely followed by emotional support. Uh, the two different categories there are uh, co-located expressions of support versus remote expressions of support. But if you look at either or, uh, it turns out 41.5% of, uh, of the journals mention that, uh, followed by instrumental support, which is 24.5%. And we have nine different categories of instrumental support that I'm not gonna get into in this talk. And finally, uh, informational support, 1.7%. Uh, so Caring Bridge, it turns out, is a place where people are more frequently talking about these other types of support, prayer, emotional, or instrumental support than information. They can go other places online um, to find informational support. So the second approach, based on the results of the content analysis, uh, we used language that we had found in Caring Bridge journals to design a survey that we then deployed to Caring Bridge users. So we think that this survey has a very high ecological validity for that reason. Uh, and we worked very closely with the Caring Bridge leadership to make sure that this survey really was going to uh, be a good user experience for people that came to the site and, and decided to click on it and take the survey. We had over a thousand participants take the survey um, and a 70% completion rate, which is actually very high in terms of uh, normal survey metrics. And it took about 15 minutes. So it was a pretty in-depth survey that got into a lot of questions, mostly focusing on instrumental support, but also asking about prayer as kind of like a comparison point. And what we found in the survey was lots of interesting results about instrumental support that I'm not gonna talk about. But uh, if we look at the way that people rated the importance of these different categories to them, so we were using Likert scale rating um, from zero, which means not at all important, to four, which means extremely important, what we found was that prayer again came out on top. Um, people rated it and the distributions, if you look at those little distributions, you can see that they have a slightly different shape than the others. There's a lot, there's an extreme, a much more, many more people are clicking that it's extremely important to me um, for the prayer category than any other category, um, uh, followed by emotional, instrumental, and then informational support again. So uh, this is interesting. Uh, we found that across both of the two approaches that we took, the quantitative approaches that we took, uh, Caring Bridge users both appreciate prayer most frequently, and they also rate prayer as the most important thing to them. So what this suggests is that we should be adding prayer into the types of, when we think about these types of social support analyses that we're doing online, prayer really should is, exist as its own category. Um, and that might, it, it may look different on different platforms, um, but at least on Caring Bridge, we know that this is something that's of crucial importance to, care, uh, to, to users. Okay, so that is the quantitative characterization of prayer support. Uh, the second study is a qualitative characterization of spiritual support. So uh, quantitative results are really interesting because they point to phenomena or they indicate that something is really important, but they can't really speak to the underlying um, way that people are experiencing those phenomena or why, why those phenomena exist that way. So what does prayer point to? 
Well, one thing that it can point to for a lot of people is religion, uh, an institutionalized system of beliefs, practices, rituals, or values. And uh, for example, on CaringBridge, uh, partially because it's located in the Midwest in Minnesota, a lot of people are Christian here. And so uh, the majority of CaringBridge users tend to be Christian. Um, but this concept of spirituality is something that's actually broader and distinct from religion and often can include religion. So a lot of, uh, in, in recent literature, people consider, uh, researchers are considering things like journaling, meditation, yoga, walks in nature, things like this can all kind of be, they become spiritual practices to people that help them feel connected in a really important and meaningful way, whether or not there's a specific type of God or a specific type of institution that is attached to that belief. So in particular, spirituality, this is, this is a common definition of spirituality that is taught to a lot of people uh, going through a med medical practice or nursing practice. Um, it, the definition that is used from Puchowski 2009 is, uh, spirituality is the aspect of humanity that refers to the way individuals seek and express meaning and purpose and the way they experience their connectedness to the moment, to self, to others, to nature, and to the significant or sacred. So the reason this, this definition was created by a group of F, uh, experts who all had to convene and were forced to come up with a definition that could really apply broadly across anyone, anyone's spiritual beliefs. They weren't allowed to leave a conference until they came up with this definition and said, okay, we're all gonna use this to make sure that we have something that is, um, as we're going through research, we can all refer back to a definition that unifies our research efforts. So we chose to use this definition because of its wide adoption um, at, in, in seeking our question, which was, what is spiritual support? And how does that relate to social support in online, in online spaces? The way that we chose to answer this question was through focus, group, uh, focus groups with four different CaringBridge stakeholder groups. And our goal was to develop a spiritual support definition that is independent of any specific belief system. Uh, the four groups that we worked with were uh, online health community and CaringBridge users. So we spoke with 11 different users. We spoke with six uh, spiritual and religious leaders. We had seven healthcare workers. So that includes doctors, nurses, chaplains, um, or even end of life uh, and any other end of life spiritual services, um, as well as 10 CaringBridge employees was in our final group uh, for 34 total participants. With these three groups, our first three stakeholder groups, we paired pe or we put we put people into groups of three or four, and we made sure that everybody in those groups had different beliefs because we really wanted to kind of get at the underlying um, things that people share in common and try to understand how uh, in online spaces often even if the majority of people share a given belief, there's almost always somebody who doesn't share that belief, and we wanted to be able to capture some of the dynamics that can that can occur in these heterogeneous spaces. And with these three groups, we asked them to complete four structured activities. Uh, one, one focus group took about, it, it generally was about around two hours to get through these four activities. The first activity was a structured conversation that we kind of mirrored after the consensus process that, that generated that spirituality definition I showed earlier. So we said, okay, you have 15 minutes or 20 minutes and your group needs to come up with your own definition of what spiritual support is. We showed them the consensus definition in order to inform uh, in, inform the definitions that they came up with. The second activity was to have them do an IDEO group brainstorm activity, which uh, the point of this is to help encourage divergent thinking and really give people space to get creative and come up with any ideas that they can possibly think of that would serve their group's, their, their group's individual sense of what spiritual support is based on the definition that they came up with. And then we asked them to pick their favorite ideas from the brainstorming activity and to sketch some of those ideas. So we gave them, uh, we gave them wireframes and asked them to make sketches either of uh, web applications or mobile applications. For example, this one, this particular sketch was one of the CaringBridge favorites. It's called the Care Map, and it shows three different screens. Uh, the first screen is a geographic representation of the patient support network and uh, it glows or the little red box around that one user icon is showing that the, uh, that person is online currently kind of giving a sense of presence. It also offers a way for the person to express what they're needing, but even more saliently, um, the second screen is showing the, prof the user profile of a person who is in the support network and wants to provide help and giving that person space to say what they're available to provide. 
um, the final window is giving people an opportunity to actually sign up on a calendar type of a presentation for, uh, for helping out with specific types of support tasks. So this was, this was just one example of a sketch that participants came up with um, in our workshops. Finally, uh, we gave people the opportunity to we use what's called the bags of stuff method, uh, where we give people a bunch of art supplies and we say, build, build whatever embodied prototype you think would be interesting for providing you with spiritual support. So this particular example on the right is a, uh, a special a uh, technological dog collar that helps when when a patient needs a needs a therapy dog to come to their room in the hospital, they can somehow connect with the therapy dog and get them to come up to their room. So after we had gathered all this data from our, our first stakeholder groups, we presented these data to CaringBridge employees. And so the data looked like the spiritual support definitions that they had come up with, the sketches, and the videos. So we, we gave the subset of data uh, to CaringBridge that people had actually felt was important enough or interesting enough to draw pictures of or to build. And employees then reflected on and ideated um, and refined the ideas that the participants had, that our earlier participants had, particip participants had brought to them. And uh, using a grounded theory analysis, which uh, for those who are not familiar on the call, I'll skip most of the details, but we, we translate or, or we, could, we convert all of the conversations into a textual format. We read every line of the manuscripts or, or of the transcripts that get generated. We cluster, uh, we cluster, we code, we code every line to give it some kind of a theme. We code, uh, we cluster those themes and then we come up with, with the uh, overlying or the, the, final, the final themes that we're gonna present in our paper. So this definition of spiritual support came through a very intensive data analysis process. So the first, now oh, I gotta move my little screen here. So the first half of the definition is that spiritual support is a dimension of social support that underlies and can be expressed through all six of the categories from prior work. So it's not something different from what's been studied before. It's actually, it's very highly related to that. Uh, so this is a participant quote that demonstrates what this is getting at. So be it through meals, through conversation, through prayer, you give them nourishment for their mind, body, and soul. I would consider all of these different avenues spiritual support. Another participant quote says that, I think that all these types of support weave together and if we separate them out, we actually lose something. Um, so this is, this is one part of the definition. The other, or, or sorry, the, uh, so the, all these six categories that I've talked through previously are all underlied by, us, by the sense of spiritual support. The second aspect of the definition is that, uh, spiritual support forms a triadic relationship. So most of the prior literature has considered social support as a dyadic relationship between some kind of a support provider and a support receiver or a support recipient. And um, this actually suggests that we have something higher than that that's getting involved in this interaction. Um, it, the sacred or the significant, that's different. Each person has their own sense of what that means. For some people that's a religious God, for other people, let's say if you're atheist or agnostic, it might be a sense of scientific contribution that you've made in your life or whatever it is that matters to you, your family, the things that are most vitally important to you making sense of your life. So we're including whatever that is in this triad and trying to make help, help people feel connected to that through the support that we're providing. And the final aspect of this definition is that spiritual support is mutual. So it's not just that a provider is giving support to the receiver. Actually, the way that people experience it, that many people, many of our participants said was that when I am giving support, I'm also receiving support at the same time. And those things are inextricable from each other. They actually come together. And so when we're thinking about designing mechanisms, we have to think just as much about the providers as much as we're thinking about the receivers because the support is going both ways, as it turns out. <laughs> okay, so for example, uh, this is the picture that I used for instrumental support. It's showing that a person is at home making homemade empanadas that they are going to drop off at someone's house. And this was, the, this was the original motivation for the first study that I presented. We wanted to understand how do we get people the instrumental support that they need. But what this definition suggests is that it's actually not really about the empanadas. Uh, that's not, it's not specifically the empanadas that are important about this. What's really important is this underlying sense of love and spiritual connection that a person is able to give through their gift of empanadas. 
And something that is not necessarily immediately obvious about this is that this can also have really important ramifications for the types of empanadas you'd make. So if your friend is a vegan or if your friend is a Muslim, it would be really offensive to give that person pork empanadas. But if your person is a meat lover, then actually giving them pork empanadas is gonna be the better choice. Um, and if it's not offensive to their religious beliefs, then that's great, give them pork empanadas. So um, a, a question that kind of comes out of this then is, what does, what does spiritual support really have to do with technology, right? What does this definition mean for how we design systems? Our participants were really clear in giving kind of two different answers. The first answer is that, you know, we need to do a better job of getting off of our technology and being super present for each other. So technology can be a huge distraction to actually being meaningfully in the room with somebody and being present and sharing that sense of spiritual connection. Um, but if I, if that was the only answer, then I don't think that anybody would be willing to give me a PhD in computer science. <laughs> so the second answer that came out of these workshops was that we need to adopt an orientation to design that carefully considers how people's spiritual and re religious values can influence their interactions in socio-technical systems. And uh, for the people who are numerically inclined on this call, uh, during the workshops, we came up with 224 unique tech ideas. We classified those ideas into six broad themes, and we came up with four design implications for online safe spaces like CaringBridge. And I wish I could talk about all four of these, but I don't have time. So I'm just gonna focus on one of them. Um, and if anybody wants to ask me in the Q&A about the others, I'm more than happy to address that question later on. So the one idea that I'm going to talk about is this concept of facilitating supportive communication. And in order to do that, we deployed a prototype uh, for supportive communication in a, narrowed it down to a mental health context. So one of the things that I've said kind of repeatedly throughout this talk is that words are really important and words constitute a fundamental medium through which people are communicating in most online platforms. So for example, this is a quote that came out of our workshop, uh, our workshops from a participant who was a healthcare provider. So my husband was in the ICU for almost two weeks. Reading Caring Bridge was like riding the wave of, wave of love. Both of us could feel the support that was in the writing. That was very tangible. So this is a pretty representative quote of the way that people talk about their experiences of reading Karen Bridge journals. People, it really means a lot to people to read the supportive comments that they're getting as they're going through these journeys. Um, but the problem is that people don't always write the right things. Um, as a matter of fact, our participants noted a whole bunch of problems that, uh, for, for example, silence or simply not knowing what to say. So say you've come to someone's Caring Bridge post or you come up to someone's post on Facebook or something and they've just disclosed a really difficult health crisis that they're going through or perhaps they just lost someone that they love. People often struggle to know what to say to that because it's not easy. Um, another problem that people mentioned was naive and unhelpful comments. So things like saying, you know, if I have a terminal illness and you just tell me everything is going to be okay, a lot of the time that feels kind of dismissive or subversive of the experience that I'm going through. And it's not, it's not actually helpful. It doesn't help me feel supported. Um, there's many other types of comments, but everything will be okay uh, is actually kind of one of those archetypal com comments that people like to make that isn't always true. Another problem is that people will say things that offend or impose on people's belief systems. So for example, prayer. We know that prayer is hugely important to Caring Bridge users. And for people that believe in, a, for, let's say a Christian God, prayer is one of the main mechanisms that does bring meaning to their experience and does help them feel connected to their God and what's most important to them. But say you're agnostic or say you're atheist and you've written a post and all the people coming to your site are saying, praying for you, praying for you, praying for you. Um, that's actually, again, kind of subversive to your experience. It's, it's like it can make people feel like they don't know you and they're not expressing things in a way that you would want them to be expressed. Um, some of our participants referred to this as like a barrage of prayers or being bombarded with prayers that they don't even want. So we kind of have a paradox here where, or a juxtaposition where on the one hand, when prayer is desired, it can be the most meaningful thing or the most important thing people going that people want to receive. On the other hand, it can be something that's actually a little bit damaging and not very supportive. 
So making that more clear in technology is something that, or finding ways to facilitate the types of experiences that people want in terms of support is a really important thing that we can do. So the design implication from this, the fact that people struggle with supportive communication is that socio-technical systems, uh, especially things like online health communities could provide mechanisms for assistance with supportive communication. And our participants brainstormed three basic ways that this might be achievable. So the first is by providing training resources within the flow of the user interface or the user experience. So for example, let's say that you're struggling to write a comment. Um, you could have a pop-up that comes up and says, hey, here's a little video about how to say the right thing or go through a kind of training module to get you to, to give you some suggestions or ideas of ways that you can communicate with this person or the types of questions you might ask them to, to help them feel like they can express themselves to you in, a, in an intimate and um, safe way. Um, or pointers to other um, expert generated resources. The second thing that our participants suggested was, well, what about recommending uh, sacred texts or significant texts? So imagine you're in the commenting interface on a place like Facebook or CaringBridge or even Twitter or something like that. And um, you don't know what to say. And actually, if we know that this person has a, if we know that the support recipient has a certain belief system, then we could recommend different texts that might be relevant to that situation that people can pick from to help them enrich their comments um, with scriptures or, or significant texts that might help them feel better. The final thing that participants talked about was algorithmic guidance on what to say or what not to say. So for example, nudges to say certain types of things, but not other types of things, or even providing people with uh, full-blown comments that they could use and adopt or um, modify to fit better with the person that they, that, to, make it, to make it seem more personalized for the person that they're using uh, or the person that they're trying to support. And uh, the final chapter of my dissertation is going to focus on this concept of algorithmic guidance for how to say the right thing. So uh, when, whenever we're thinking about this, there's two main things that the socio-technical system or the algorithm really needs to be able to do for people. The first is it needs to be able to understand the context of the support recipient's problems or needs based on the text that they've provided. And the second is that it needs to be able to respond effectively to the problems or the needs that the person has been writing about. So we built a prototype that we called flipped out, uh, which is a play on words. <laughs> uh, flipped out the phrase means someone's kind of going a little crazy or is feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Um, but we want to be able to flip those types of doubts to make it a more positive experience for someone. Uh, this, this is a novel prototype that we built for cognitive reappraisal. Um, cognitive reappraisal is a specific, a specific skill that is frequently taught in therapy contexts. So for example, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy are these well-established therapy modalities where they teach this skill, which involves taking a negative thought that you have and trying to change that thought to become more positive in a way so that you can have a better emotional relationship with that thought. So flipping the thought to make it into something that's a little bit more positive or supportive for you. And in order to do this, what we, uh, the, one of the problems actually is that cognitive reappraisal is really hard for people, especially that are going through some kind of a mental health illness. They frequently get stuck in a certain thought pattern and trying to think of things in a different way is hard. So um, our concept of flipped out is that we can provide them with cognitive reappraisals that were generated by other humans in order to help them learn how to eventually flip their own thoughts um, internally. So we did this using, uh, we took a crowdsourcing tech uh, approach to this using Amazon Mechanical Turk. And uh, we asked random untrained um, Amazon, Mechanical, Amazon Mechanical Turk workers to flip the negative thoughts that our participants were submitting to the system. And we kind of, we're, we're saying this is roughly analogous to uh, some type of a mental health online community or user uh, therapy groups or something like that, where people don't have a lot of skill or a lot of specialized knowledge in how to do cognitive reappraisal at the outset. Um, and we did, we deployed Flipped Out with 13 graduate students uh, at the University of Minnesota over a one month period to see how uh, encouraging them to use the, the use the app anytime that they felt like it um, and get they would get three cognitive appraisals back in turn from their one in original input thought and we asked them to rate those thoughts um, and i'll show a little bit about that in a second 
So the goal of this was actually to gather training data to understand, because in order to build any type of an algorithm, you need a vast amount of data and that data doesn't exist by default. So we have to create that data. Uh, so one of the purposes was to gather training data and the other purpose was to actually look at this data, to analyze this data, to learn about what, uh, what is the context of these input thoughts? How can we capture that algorithmically? And what are some effective ways to respond to that? So really kind of setting up this, this way of understanding what, what, will, what will allow us to provide really good assistance with supportive communication. So this is what the prototype looked like uh, in a nutshell. We asked people to use, for, for input, they could enter any negative thought that they had. So the example here is, I feel ugly because I'm having a bad hair day. And then they received three different reappraisals back from Amazon Mechanical Turk, and we call these reframes. So for example, my favorite one on this slide is uh, every hairstyle brings out a different side of my beauty. You know, if I was having a bad hair day, that actually would make me laugh and probably help me to feel a little bit better. So participants rated, uh, rated all three of the reframes that they had. And uh, this gave us a data set at the end of a month long deployment period of about 370 different inputs and around 800, uh, a, bit, a bit over 800 ratings. So we did get uh, about 1200 reframes back, but not all of them ended up being rated um, at the end of the day. So unfortunately, this is a limited amount of data when it comes to actually building machine learning models, but it's a very rich amount of data that allowed us to build uh, a, a structured way of understanding what this data looks like. So uh, here's some example. Here's a couple of examples that I absolutely love. Um, we didn't design anything about flipped out to specifically speak to religion or spirituality because we wanted to see what happened with our organic system usage. But even though we didn't specifically design that, these examples happened um, organically in the wild. So the first is that a participant entered, I'm trying to accomplish too many things this summer, and the thought went on a little bit longer. But the reframe that came back was, I am blessed to have so many options on how to spend my summer. And the participant rated this at two stars, and they said, I never used the word blessed, it's too religious for me. So even if that reframe might have been a really good way to think about the situation or something that could have helped that person feel better, including this single word, blessed, made them rate it a lot lower than maybe they otherwise would have. A different participant uh, wrote this input thought that was, I feel responsible for too many things that are out of my control. And the reframe that came back was, do your best and let God do the rest. Um, the participant provide, uh, provided a, a rating of 4.5 stars for this reframe, specifically because it appealed to a, a religious aspect of her experience. So the person wrote, this was a good response because it reminded me to pray and trust that God will help me out. So it seems pretty clear that if participant A had received this, um, this, second, this second reframe, they may have also rated the same reframe very low because of that inclusion of religious language. So it really shows how, how much people's spirituality or religion impacts how they're interacting with the words that they receive in online spaces. All right. Uh, and so this is, at the end of the day, you know, I don't have a lot of time to get into the specifics of all of these different labels, but we developed two code books that we used to uh, understand both the inputs and the reframes. And we considered the codes that we generated to be uh, labels that could eventually be used either in algorithmic systems or for some type of statistical analysis. So um, to, uh, when we're talking about the inputs, we captured three different contextual factors of the inputs related to timing. So whether this is the past, present, or the future, um, the topic of the thought, as well as the higher level kind of cognitive um, elements of the thought. So for example, um, is this something where I'm self-disparaging? Am I ruminating on others' thoughts? Or am I worrying about something that's gonna happen in the future? Um, we also created a code book that captures uh, information about how the thoughts were reframed or the ways that people responded to these negative input thoughts. Uh, and we, ca we came with two different broad categories. One is a specific tactic that people took. So uh, changing current circumstances, looking at agency. So uh, emphasizing people's ability to do something or maybe giving it a silver lining saying like, okay, this maybe is a bad thing but this bad thing also has positive consequences. Um, as, as well as the second category of codes in this, in this um, the reframe code book had to do with meta behaviors. 
So things that the Amazon Mechanical Turkers were doing that weren't specifically related to how they were reframing the thought, but additional um, behaviors that they were displaying. Like, for example, adding a bunch of uh, personal context into the reframe that wasn't present in the original thought or challenging the under, uh, trying to undermine or challenge some of the assumptions present in the original thoughts. Um, I'll talk about a couple of these things, but I don't have time to talk about all of them. Uh, one of the things that we found, for example, in the temporal category was that mechan mechanical turkers, it turns out, are a lot better at uh, reframing things that happen that are going to happen in the future because it's possible. We don't have a specific causal explanation for this, but they're better at explaining th reframing things that might happen in the future, possibly because the future is more fluid um, that than things like the present, which you know maybe you can do something about it. In the past, you really kind of can't do anything to change it. Um, so that's one, one aspect. We saw that the context actually did change the, the way that people were able to provide effective ratings for, for uh, negative input thoughts. Uh, and for example, we saw that some of these tactics and meta behaviors that I've highlighted are much, they, they seemed to be a little bit more effective than some of the others. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the issues with the study is that we have a fairly limited amount of data. So we didn't have um, independent data points and we didn't have enough data to really do a strong statistical analysis on this. But instead of focusing on that, um, I'm going to talk about how we think that these results can shape uh, processes for developing algorithms that could help with cognitive reappraisal um, in the future. So we propose a human com computation pipeline for cognitive appraisal, reappraisal specifically, where we start by having a negative input thought, we produce a certain number of reframes, and the second step, we might want to moderate those reframes and then select which of those reframes are we going to present to the user. Um, in the case of flipped out, we selected n equals three. So we produced three in, uh, reframes and we used random crowd workers to do that. But we skipped steps B and C because our goal was just to generate training data and to develop labels and to understand a little bit about what might be effective. However, let's take a hypothetical future goal of developing an online health community for mental health where people are going to be practicing cognitive reappraisal. This is really promising because um, we know that things like the, the therapy groups I was mentioning earlier, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, people get to be in person and actually practice these skills with one another. And they have a therapist in the room who can moderate and can help to get gain that, to help them learn that skill. Um, but this type of therapy is expensive uh, it's covered by insurance sometimes, but whether or not you have access to insurance or transportation or a way to get to these groups is, you know, that's, that's dependent on privilege, that's dependent on a lot of things that people don't always have access to. So creating these types of resources online could be a very helpful way for um, teaching people how to deal better with their negative thoughts. In this type of a context, we can't just skip steps B and C. We actually need to think very carefully about how we might introduce an algorithm to help with this situation. Um, so in the first case of producing reframes, uh, flipped out, you know, if we can, if we can acquire enough data to, to develop a statistical understanding of which types of tactics are better for which types of input context, then we can actually, uh, in the process of generating reframes, provide suggestions about which types of tactics might be effective for, for, for a given um, input thought. We can also do something like what our participants, our Cambridge, participants suggested of providing some text to start out with, um, to help people in that, in that task of doing the cognitive reappraisal. So for example, one of the things that was really, really helpful, our participants said uh, in the interviews and in the reasons that they provided through the interface was that um, when people acknowledge the main concern of what's, going, of what's going on in the input negative thought and then shift to making it a more positive thought that really helped them because it helps them feel heard. It helps them feel like you actually get the problem that I'm talking about. Um, so perhaps instead of having an algorithm reframe the entire thought, we could just have an algorithm do something like provide a little clause that acknowledges that main concern and then allow a human to do the rest. So those are two kind of examples of ways that we might design algorithms to help with this um, cognitive reappraisal task. Secondly, uh, if we're in an online health community situation, there's always this risk of uh, negative act or bad, bad actors, people who have negative intentions coming into the space 
to um, do things that are not actually helpful or could actually be damaging. So if you're someone who's vulnerable and coming to a mental health community um, seeking support, it's really bad if someone trolls you or, or makes fun of you or says bad things. So we imagine that we can use algorithms to help moderate. Um, so giving peers some kind of a mechanism to help filter through the large quantity of uh, reframes that might be delivered, identify the negative ones or the ones that just aren't very effective. For example, uh, Flipped Out showed that direct negation of thoughts is something that is really unhelpful. If, if I say I'm feeling really scared about this and someone just says I'm feeling really happy about this, that doesn't actually help. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't add any nuance. And so kind of giving people an opportunity to identify and remove those types of comments um, before they actually before they hit the eyeballs of the users who's receiving them is another space for algorithmic innovation. Um, and in this context, we actually might decide to just allow all acceptable reframes to go through and uh, to, to meet the end user. However, there might be other contexts where we even need to think about fewer steps in this pipeline. So for example, imagine that we have a goal of developing a private application for mental health that is going to provide people with cognitive reappraisals on the fly. So they have a negative thought and they can't think of a, a new way to think about it. And so they go on their app to, to, get, to get a cognitive reappraisal. Um, in this case, let's assume that we have a huge data set of cognitive reappraisals that have been created in the past by humans. Well, we might actually not need to be producing any new reframes. And we might actually not need to moderate them. We already have a high quality set of data. This actually becomes an issue of matching that negative input thought to a pre-existing negative input thought that exists in the database and trying to select which of the reframes that we have available are the best reframes to present this to, to present to this user and how many of them should we pre be presenting to the user. Um, we have some evidence from our interviews that people really appreciated actually seeing three different reframes because, and often those three different reframes would take different strategies. And well, one or two of the strategies might not work, but perhaps that third strategy actually worked really well and helped me to feel better. Um, so actually having the ability to compare different options might be useful for people, but we also don't wanna overwhelm them and provide too many um, reframe options because they can't necessarily focus on one particular one, um, which is a classic information overload problem and something that um, is, is our, our work can't speak to the best value of it. And that's something that future work will have to speak to. So uh, future work for Flipped Out is going to be very clearly gathering and labeling large enough data sets that we can actually build some of these algorithms that I've been talking about. Um, and another really important con uh, consideration in this context is making sure that we take a user-centered approach to the development of the algorithms rather than just building an algorithm and putting it out there and assuming that this is what people want. Um, and finally, uh, there's been a lot of controversy lately around using big data um, in ways that really can influence people's lives. Um, for example, most of the data that we generate is coming from these readily available data sources that are biased towards men, they're biased towards uh, Caucasian people. They don't necessarily, they're not representative of what the population looks like. So making sure that as we gather these data for, um, for such a sensitive context as mental health, that we are focusing on diversity, inclusiveness, equity, and fairness in the way that we're gathering our data to train these models. Um, beyond flipped out, the future work that I have for this line of thinking about spiritual support in general, um, something I think is really important is replicating this work in other contexts. So we did this work with CaringBridge and we know that CaringBridge looks a certain way and has a certain uh, demographics of their user base um, that might be different um, on Facebook or Twitter or Reddit or any other places online where people go to get support. Um, and I think both replicating both the survey that we did and the focus groups are both valuable future work endeavors. Um, another interesting question is what happens if we look at homogeneous groups of people rather than heterogeneous groups of people? So are the spiritual support mechanisms that people come up with if they are just talking about, you know, people that go to their own church or their own synagogue, um, are, are those different? Do those look different if we're just talking with homogeneous groups of people? Another issue is that this work was completed um, in the context of health specifically, and it was completed in a safe space. So people, a lot of our participants talk about Caring Bridge as something very special. Um, it has a very different flavor to it than a Facebook where anybody can come on Facebook, anybody can go on Reddit, 
And, uh, you know, there's a lot of context collapse with people um, showing up and you don't really know people's motivations in these spaces, but on Caring Bridge, there's no ads. You have very special privacy controls that let you choose who's coming to your site and how your site can be discovered. And uh, it's a very different type of a space. Um, so looking at this spiritual support in other contexts that are not necessarily safe spaces or in uh, other, other aspects of online experiences. And finally, something that I haven't talked about, I've been, I've been focusing really on the supportiveness of religion and spirituality, but something that I think is undeniable in the world that we live in is that religion can also be used as a force for oppressive, oppression, manipulation, and abuse. And uh, the ways in which we think about it in our system design, we don't wanna necessarily just empower people to have religion be infiltrating every aspect of their online lives um, because that could actually be really damaging and problematic. Um, so trying to figure out that line of like, where do we, where do we focus on this in our designs and where should we actually explicitly not focus on this in our designs? Um, so, and of course the, the most important future work is developing the higher collective consciousness of all humanity and bringing us into spiritual unity. So I'll, I'll leave that, I'll leave that for, for future, for future research. Um, so uh, with that, I am at the end of my talk. These are all the papers that I have had the opportunity to work on um, during grad school. I only talked about these three during the course of this talk. Um, and I need to take a moment to acknowledge all the people that have made this possible for me. Um, so first is my advisors, Lauren Trevine and Susan O'Connor Vaughn, who uh, showed up for me halfway through my PhD at a time when I didn't know how I was gonna keep going and they picked me up and helped me and supported me through this and I would not be here without them. So I'm extremely grateful. Um, Joe Constant and Dan Keefe are both serving on my committee and I am super appreciative for their guidance and their advice as, uh, as I've been working through the drafts of my thesis. Um, all of these wonderful humans are people who have been co-authors on the study that the study, the three studies that I presented in this work. So Zach Livonian, Highway Ma, Robert G. Kinto, Sabrina Lee, Gemma Line, uh, Lana, I can't even, <laughs> Abilene, Katie, Mary Jo, Susan. Um, we've got Hannah, Daniel, and Lauren, and of course, Will Lane, um, all of my very good friends and collaborators, people that have made a huge difference as I've been going through this process of writing a dissertation. Um, and of course, Caring Bridge. Um, I would not have been able to do this work without, without Caring Bridge working with me through every, every step of the way, especially Pat, who I just saw turned her video on. I'm so appreciative. She has been awesome, really helping me push through and make this work. Um, Bridget Bonner, Carrie Vollmer, Heather Jarvie, and Luana um, Ojala have also all been instrumental in, in helping me to facilitate this and make it happen. Um, and then all of these other names, I'm not even going to begin. These are the names of my co-authors, my colleagues at Group Lens, some of my best friends who have been there for me at hard moments, some CSGSA officers, people <laughs> who kept me going. And um, yeah, this, uh, this is finally, I just, I'm dedicating this dissertation to my mom and my dad, especially my mom who passed away uh, in 2015 and whose Caring Bridge site kind of <laughs> led me down this road. So thanks to, thanks to mom for helping me out from the other side. And there we go. I am ready for some questions. Thank you. Why don't we just take a moment? You can use video, you can use audio. If you feel like applauding, take this moment to do so. Let's give Estelle a moment to catch her breath. <laughs> Because we have uh, a, a good sized crowd here, and because I can't see all of you at once, I'm gonna ask you if you would like to ask a question, if you'd go in the participants window and raise your hand. Um, well, I'll call on people that way first. And, um, and then if there's a die down of questions, we'll, we'll just go to uh, first come first serve speaking, so. Now is your chance and, whoops, I saw one, but it went away. So we'll give it a chance. Lisa, yes. Go ahead, Lisa, unmute and ask your question. Uh, I'd love to. So uh, so my name is Lisa Carney Anderson and I uh, uh, knew Estelle back when she was Colleen. And, uh, 
And uh, I, and as you all can see, uh, she's just a superb communicator. That's how I knew her when she was she was my student and then my teaching assistant. Um, so one of the things I was thinking about is I, I was wondering if you saw any evidence in some of your data collection that the way people um, asked about uh, provided support was to say something scientific. Someone might say, I have a breast, I, 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 I was just diagnosed with breast cancer. And I might say, oh, I'm just so sorry. But I, you know, I just want you to know that, that the research in breast cancer has just gone by leaps and bounds. And, you know, you know, there's some really good work out here and, and, um, and, and breast cancer isn't what it used to be. You're going to make it right. Um, and that, and that might be a, um, you know, that might be a way for someone to, to, to respond who, who lives in that world or, or um, <laughs> sees support in a different way. And so, and the other thing I was thinking about is how you all started on this journey before your mom died, you were thinking about how to make information accessible. Yeah. So could you imagine, <laughs> could you imagine a platform where someone said, you know, I have, I have lung cancer, I have breast cancer, you know, uh, how can I find good information? How can I, you know, how can I find uh, something that's not hydroxychloroquine or, or yeah. you know, that sort okay. of thing. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, I, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts about those things. Yeah, so um, one thing that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, has not yet occurred is an in-depth analysis of the content of uh, CaringBridge comments. So, and that, and that's where we might actually find the answer to that question. Is like, um, I've, I've, I've incidentally read a whole bunch of them, and we've used comments. For example, we did. Um, this wasn't the set, one of the studies that I talked about, but we, uh, my collaborator Hai Wai Ma and I, and some of the other folks on here. Um, did a study that was looking at what types of factors affect user retention or user engagement on CaringBridge. And we used just the volume of comments received as something that um, predicts whether or not they will stick around. And the answer is yes, it does. If you receive more comments, you're more likely to stay on the site. This is a very well-known, well-replicated finding. Um, but that specific question of like, okay, what is the quality of those comments? Are they containing, is it all emotional support? Is it all, um, is it all esteem support? Is it all prayer? Um, there is probably some information that happens in there. My suspicion is that because what we saw in the Caring Bridge journals was that people weren't saying, they weren't as often saying, thank you for the resources, thank you for the information, or thank you for that scientific perspective on the problem. That, that doesn't, that's not typically how people are engaging on Caring Bridge, but there's a lot of other sites that people have studied um, where people do focus primarily on informational support and like the kind of more scientific findings that you might expect. So there's online communities like one is called Patients Like Me, for example, where people can go oh. and they can specifically, they're not looking for people that they know, they're looking for people that have been through the same site, the same type of a health crisis. And those people are going to be the people who are like, oh yeah, you know, five years ago I had this treatment and it sucked and it made me feel awful, but I just heard about this new thing that they're coming out with and you should check that out. Or people who are going through the same um, situation that maybe are going through that experimental treatment right now and can have, can immediately provide feedback on that. So uh, I think there's a different care. So in all of the different online spaces where people are interacting, I think there's differences in the character of the way that people respond. Um, and I think that that type of communication does happen for sure. Um, but I don't think that CaringBridge, that's, that's not the primary focus on CaringBridge. Um, something that I, I also didn't say this explicitly during the talk, but a lot of, a lot of the, there's a practice that we know about. This isn't all CaringBridge sites, but uh, a number of CaringBridge sites, the way that they actually get people following them is that the pastor at the church or the rabbi at the synagogue or whoever says, oh my gosh, our, a member of our congregation has fallen ill. Here's the CaringBridge link. And so people go and uh, they post it in the bulletin and people are being directed to the caring bridge directly from um, a spiritual community. So, which is another reason that uh, these issues show up so strongly um, on caring bridge sites. But yeah, that is, that is true that I originally, when I first started the program, I was very much thinking more about that information and like, how do we get good information out there? And I never would have anticipated this, this turn. <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope that answers the question a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. TV. 
Hi, Estelle. Thank you for a lovely uh, presentation. Uh, I just want to say quickly, I love your slide design. My slide design is terrible and I need to like take some cues from you about how to make pretty slides. Um, I wanted to ask you about the idea of spiritual support specifically as supplementing Kutron and Soar's um, support framework. And so I, I actually really, I think I've told you this before, I really like how it supplements, I think, what's the gap in how HCI and online health community research conceptualizes uh, support in kind of this binary of it's either informational or it's emotional and that's kind of limited. Yeah. I think one of the things we've talked about is that computer scientists are cold and heartless and objective <laughs> and may not necessarily buy into this idea yeah. that religion is really important to a large group of people that may not themselves be in the academy. And so I was wondering if you could talk about how you plan on pitching this as a really important thing <laughs> that uh, future researchers should consider, despite the fact that your, your data and your studies all show that this is really, really important for people. Yeah, uh, this is this is something that I think about all the time because I'm like, oh man, if I'm going to be successful in academia, I have to get grants. <laughs> and um, there was there was a paper that came out by uh, Elizabeth Bowie and Blythe, I believe, where they actually listed one of the reasons that people um, haven't gotten as much into spirituality and religion in social computing and HCI is because they're concerned about funding um, and being able to get people to pay for it. So this is this is like a definitely a super important question. Um, I think that one of the ways of doing this is actually uh, doing a type of analysis where we look and we use language. So for example, the types of methods that you use, um, identifying spiritual language and doing large scale analyses that show something about how this language is impacting people. So for example, if we go on Reddit or if we go on Facebook or if we go, I mean, on CaringBridge, obviously, you know, that's broad broadening beyond CaringBridge. Um, and we can actually show something about how this language is impacting people's experiences in a positive way, then all of a sudden, wow, I've got this, I've got this large scale evidence that this is, that this is uh, a phenomenon that's worth looking at and something that matters. Because um, I think that, you know, the qualitative, absolutely the qualitative work that I've done points to that being the most, at least with the people that I've talked to, one of the fundamental, super important things to them. Um, and I think that there's kind of a minimization of qualitative work sometimes, even though even though it even though it's half the field in HCI, um, sometimes people don't weight it as, as heavily as some of the big quant results. So that's one way I would say is actually doing some studies where we have we look we look at language things and see how these spiritual religious language um, affect people, uh, especially in the I, I'm really one of the things I think it's really low hanging fruit. So this prayer concept of um, like, imagine you went on Facebook and you are going through a health crisis and Facebook detects that with their machine learning algorithm or something. It'd be really easy to just say, pop a pop-up that says, you know, are you interested in receiving prayer support from people? Or are you not interested in receiving prayer support from people? And um, for some people that answer will be yes. For some people that answer will be no. And if they just say no, then we can nudge people away from using that kind of language and see how that impacts their, their feelings of support. So I think that one way to convince people is just having data um, and having that data, you know, large quantitative things that, that support it. Um, and another way is just doing more studies in more contexts, like I was talking about, that really demonstrate, it's not just a caring bridge phenomenon. It's, it's, a, it's a much broader phenomenon. Um, I would love to see a study that looked at a bunch of different platforms and looked at the prevalence, for example, just the raw prevalence of the, the prayer words or the warm vibes or the, healing, like the, the types of energy words that I had talked about in our spiritual uh, or our prayer support definition. So more, more studies, a little bit more studies um, <laughs> to look at this in other contexts and show things in a more quantitative way, I think would help to convince the cold hard scientists. So as a cold hard scientist who doesn't see any hands up, I'm gonna ask a follow up on that, which is, um, how do different uh, modalities and designs from what you've seen so far affect the type of support that we're seeing? And, and I, I'll give you two contrasts. You know, there is Caring Bridge as an online support site versus offline, but there's also Caring Bridge versus unstructured online. You know, what would happen if that site didn't exist and Somebody sent out, you know, a pastor sends out a message saying so and so's in the hospital. Here's her email address, and people send wishes by email. 
what do you have in the way of information from your work or from, from prior work about how the focusing of the site or the fact that it's online shape the type of support? Yeah, so I guess I can't speak too much to anything about email. I haven't seen any <laughs> studies about email, people email. I'm sure that they do. I know, I, obviously this happened and maybe back in 1996, <laughs> that, was, that was before Caring Bridge existed, um, something that happened. But uh, I think that uh, one thing I think is that I, I sort of was hinting at this earlier, but on Caring Bridge, I do think that, that the way that it's integrated into online offline um, does shape a lot of the way that religion and spirituality kind of comes out in that space. Um, on sites like Facebook, for example, it's a lot more freeform. It's, it, it, there's a lot, diff, a, a much broader variety of people that you might have in your network that you know from different places and you're not being as curated about who's coming. And so the types of support you get, I think, you know, are going to be different. Um, or, you know, the, the way that people are interacting is it's, they're trying to focus their comments on you, but they're also, they're also engaging in this environment where there's so much distraction and there's so many other things that they could be doing that I, I wonder about the quality of the comments that people are receiving um, on, for example, CaringBridge versus Facebook. So I, for, here's a hypothesis. CaringBridge comments maybe are longer and more thoughtful than the, th the types of things that we would see on Facebook. That's one way that the environment might impact the, the interaction. Um, certainly the types of things that people disclose. So for example, there's some recent work that talks about um, privacy and the way that privacy impacts disclosure. Um, so on, and actually some of this work takes place on Facebook. So uh, if you look at Facebook groups, Facebook groups are one of the online health community contexts where people do use these groups. And sometimes people, if you have a really rare disease and there's not a lot of people that um, have gone through that experience, and you go to a Facebook group where like all 20 people in this group are the 20 people in Iowa that have had this, this particular disorder, um, they can get much better support from that little group than they could from anywhere else actually, because people really understand them in that space. Um, and the way that that works is that, so the, the privacy settings, so people, first of all, can't get in, they, they generally aren't admitted to the group unless they have the condition, but there's also this phenomenon of people posting publicly in the group um, about kind of a high level issue. And then they take those conversations, people can respond to them and send direct messages as a follow up where they get into these really in depth conversations that um, are more intimate and are more protected because they're not going to the whole group. So um, I, I guess the big answer there is that uh, the, the amount of privacy that people have really affects um, the, the type of communications that they're gonna receive. Um, I, I think something that's really interesting that I didn't talk about at all in this talk is um, that care map actually sketched where it shows like geographic representations of things. And Dan Keefe obviously knows about this. We, we, did, uh, we did a little bit of preliminary work looking at visualizing support. So if we, can, if we can create compelling ways of showing the faces of all the people that care about us, um, does that change the character of the support as well? Like, does it provide, um, does it provide, does it make it easier for me to ask the people that I, that I know to help me? Or does it just help me to feel more of this sense of presence and connection if I'm, if I'm seeing faces versus reading text? Um, so there's a lot of different ways I think that support can play out in a lot of different platforms. Um, those are just a couple of thoughts off the top of my mind. <laughs> Great, thank you. I'm gonna do one more round of asking for questions from anyone, and then we're going to bring the public part of this to a close. Okay, well, thank you to, oh wait, I've got one question coming in. Go right ahead. Hi, Seth. Can, Hi. Can you hear me? Hi, yeah. uh, great presentation. I'm just wondering if you have any insights on, um, I know your, 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 your research is focusing on um, written comments and journal, all words. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any insights on uh, the, the impact of emojis, and videos <laughs> yeah. for, for someone going through uh, their health journey. Yeah, I. that's another thing that I would be absolutely fascinated to look at. Um, as far as I know, we haven't done that. We haven't done that study on Caring Bridge. So Caring Bridge has um, little amps. They're a little heart symbol that has radiating spirit coming off of it. Um, one of the ways that people can respond on Caring Bridge uh, is by without without leaving a message, uh, just clicking an amp and say, it's basically kind of it's kind of like a Facebook like. Um, 
or I believe you have the prayer. Do you have the prayer hands now on Caring Bridge? Um, anyways, I, these things are, they're, they're additional mechanisms for showing support that actually can sometimes, I think, address a gap in like, for example, if you don't know what to say, one of the things that you can do is react with an emoji. And that's something that happens all the time on Facebook. Facebook has a lot of different options for that. Um, and Caring Bridge is more limited in terms of that. Um, I think it's valuable in that it provides people an alternative to actually speaking. Uh, for the first part, um, but I haven't actually done any any studies or research that looks at that. Um, oh, that's that's my dog saying hello. Um, <laughs> um, one thing that I you know one thing that's interesting about emojis and about the prayer emoji, the prayer hand emoji in particular, is that it really has two meanings. There's there's a very Christian meaning to it, or a, or a religious meaning to it of praying specifically. But it also kind of has been used a lot for just saying thank you or to express gratitude or to or even namaste, you know, from a from a yoga perspective. So this kind of speaks to an interesting like one of my colleagues, Hannah, who I, I think might be on the call right now, has done some work on understanding how different emojis are um, interpreted differently. Um, you don't necessarily know if someone is going to look at the image that you provided as an emoji and interpret it the same way that you meant it. So it's something that's important to think about when we're when we're uh, des both designing emojis and interpreting them. Um, but yeah, that's a great that's a great point of uh, thinking about future work um, is how do how do these visuals play in and how how do they help people feel supported? Well, thanks. Um, just to, to respond to that, uh, the the praying hand emoji is coming. Uh, look coming. for it in Q one <laughs> of twenty twenty one. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I know I've heard I know I've heard conversations about it at Caring Bridge, but I, I didn't think that it I wasn't sure if it actually had been implemented yet. But um, I think that that emoji is going to get uh, is going to get some love. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you to all of you who have joined us. Uh, this is going to bring an end to the public piece of this. If you want to applaud, if you want to flash your camera <laughs> on and wave on your way out. Uh, <laughs> well, this is a this is a our public space. Woo! I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming. It really means a lot to see you guys here. So nice job, Estelle. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, and for the committee, we'll give people a minute to disappear, and then we'll resume. All right, I'll just hang out, I guess, right here. Yeah, you stay here. Yep, <laughs> can do.